Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. May the Spirit of Jesus be in our hearts this morning. May the joy of the Lord rise among us. May He grant us great wisdom, perspicacity, enthusiasm for the next two days. May He grant that every one of us can clear our mind of every distraction to focus on this subject about which this symposium is dedicated. But I want to tell you about Larry Walters, who for a brief period of time in 1973 was a very famous American. You see, in July of 1973, he did something that got his picture on the front page of every newspaper in America. <laughs> Larry Walters was a truck driver, but his thought life was in the stratosphere. His thought life was about aviation. He had the dream of flight. And one day, Larry Walters was in his backyard in North Hollywood, California, in a lawn chair, looking up, as he often did, into the sky to watch the airplanes coming in to land at Los Angeles International Airport, LAX. And as he did so, he got a brilliant but harebrained idea. You see, as he looked up there, it occurred to him to do something which he'd never done before. And he went down to the war surplus store, and he bought some lengths of uh, clothesline rope and a tank of helium and some surplus weather balloons. And he came home, and the first thing he did is he took a knife and cut the rope into various lengths and used it to lash down his lawn chair to the ground. And then he began to inflate the helium balloons. And one by one, he tied them to the lawn chair. Soon the chair was straining. It was, it, was, it was just begging to be released from the earth. And finally, when he deemed that he had enough balloons tied to the chair, he went into the house, made himself a sandwich, came back out with a BB gun in one hand and a knife in the other, and he began to cut the restraints that held the chair to the ground. Now, I have no way to know what he thought was going to happen. It, it may have been his opinion that the chair would gently rise into the atmosphere, but in fact, it went up like a rocket. And within a very few minutes, he was at 17,000 feet in a lawn chair. <laughs> By the way, this is a true story. This is a true story. Anybody who wants to look up the newspapers of July 3rd, 1973, it is almost a certainty, no matter what paper you look in, you're gonna find a picture of Larry Walters. Well, there he was at 17,000 feet, and you can imagine what this did to the air traffic pattern around Los Angeles International Airport. The planes were calling in and they were saying to the tower, they're saying, tower, you can't imagine, you can't imagine what we're seeing up here. And the tower says, we know, we've already had reports. There's a guy in a lawn chair. And, the, and of course the FAA went berserk. They wanted to revoke his license. And then they realized Larry Walters didn't have a license. You don't have to have a license to fly a lawn chair. And the, the long and the short of it was that uh, somewhere along the line he dropped his BB gun. And that was going to be his method of getting down was he was going to shoot out, uh, puncture holes in the, in the weather balloons one by one. That didn't work out, but he finally did get down. His, his uh, lawn chair came to rest on one side of a power line uh, near Santa Monica, California with, with the clothesline rope draped over the the high tension line beside him, shorting out the electric service to half the town of Santa Monica, California. <laughs> now, for this, he got his picture in the paper. He was temporarily a celebrity. Uh, a, a club in Houston quite properly awarded him the Bonehead of the Year Award. He was on television. He was on the, I think it was on the Johnny Carson show. And everybody wanted to ask him this question. This was the burning question people wanted to ask of Larry Walters. What in the world were you thinking about? What would prompt you to do such a dumb thing? Arguably the most colossal blunder of all time. And his answer, having done this, this stupid, stupid thing, was a classic. He said, well, you know, a man can't just sit around. A man can't just sit around. Now, whatever else you may take home from this symposium, I hope you'll bear that in mind. A man can't just sit around. A woman can't just sit around. 
a follower of Jesus Christ can't just sit around. Now, we're in the middle of a culture war. We didn't ask to be in a culture war any more than our, our fathers and grandfathers asked to be in World War II or the Civil War or the Revolutionary War, but we are. We're in a culture war, a war in which life or death issues and the fate of nations and the souls of, of men and women are at stake. And God does not expect us to be AWOL in this culture war. He doesn't expect us to be couch potatoes. And so this symposium this morning, this symposium is about Christians in the public square, Christians in politics. Now some in the room may say I'm not interested in politics, but frankly, that kind of a comment, as Abraham Lincoln pointed out, makes about as much sense as a fish that says I'm not interested in water. Politics is all around us. It affects everything we do. You want a good paying job when you graduate? Well, the question of whether you will be able to have such a job depends in large part on political decisions. <coughs> I beg your pardon. How many days a year do you think we should work to pay our taxes? 25, 50, 100? Actually, some people pay, uh, work more than 150 days per year to pay their taxes, some even more than that. The question of how much you will work to pay your taxes is a political decision. 2.8 million Americans have been killed or wounded in wars on foreign soil. Should we send American fighting men and women to other countries at war? That is a political decision. Speed limits on our highways, political decision. Should marijuana be legalized? A political decision, and by the way, one that will be on the ballot here in Colorado in a few weeks. What about abortion? Homosexual marriage, homeschooling, global climate change, oil and gas development, health care. To my regret, all of these decisions, and a great many more, are all political decisions. Uh, in my opinion, our life has become much too politicized. But it's a fact of life whether I agree with it or not. Our lives are so intertwined these days with the government that to say I'm not interested in politics is something like saying I'm not interested in life. Occasionally we'll hear people say, well, God doesn't want his people mixed up in politics, and frankly, <coughs> that's bogus. Uh, that is not historically true. You remember that Nehemiah was already high in the political world when God called him home from the uh, Persian kingdom to repair the walls of Jerusalem. And of course, David was a shepherd when God called him to the public square and said, Come on out, I'm going to introduce you to Goliath, and by the way, bring your slingshot. And after all of that, then of course David rose to the highest political position in the land, that of king, a man after God's own heart. And Wilberforce and Telemachus, about whom you'll be hearing very shortly, Patrick Henry, Abram Kuyper, Clarence Thomas, thank you very much, and many others, countless others all through the centuries, in every age, God has called his people to the public square to provide political leadership. As Martin Luther put it, though we are active in the battle, if we are not fighting where the battle is the hottest, we are traitors to the cause. My dear friends, in this year, <coughs> in the 21st century, the hottest battles are being decided in politics, in the public square, and I think personally that Dante may yet be proven right that the hottest place in hell is reserved for those who remain neutral in times of great moral conflict. Now before we talk about the issues that are in the public square, one quick disclaimer. Colorado Christian University does not endorse political parties or candidates. We have strongly held convictions about political issues, and we're going to talk about some of them today. We are absolutely convinced that followers of Jesus Christ are called to political activity. The university, however, does not endorse candidates or parties. That's up to each of us to decide as individual citizens. Now, in the public square, perhaps the longest and most malevolent shadow is cast by that certain decision of the United States Supreme Court, the infamous Roe versus Wade decision. In that case, decided a few decades ago, 
The United States Supreme Court discovered in the Constitution, or I think it's fair to say invented out of whole cloth, a right to abortion, and in the process made it essentially impossible for state or federal government to afford protection to unborn children. And in the decades since then, there have been no less, in this country, no less than 55 million abortions. God is a creator of life. A Bible says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Jeremiah 1 5. For you were created my envelope's being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and one free made. Your works is wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in a secret place. And I was thrown together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were gained for me. It was written in your book, for one of them came to be. Psalm 139, 13 from 16. For I know the pains I have for you, cares the Lord. Pains prepared for you, for not to harm you. Pains to give you hope in the future. Jeremiah 29, 11. Abortion is one of the greatest tragedies of all time. It is a grievous sin. And I say that fully aware of the fact that there are women in this room who have had an abortion. And there are men in this room who have counseled a woman to have abortion. I want to make it clear I am not here to criticize you any more than Jesus condemned the woman at the well. Abortion grieves God. Abortion facilitated by a completely improper decision of the United States Supreme Court, a decision which I believe earnestly followers of Jesus must seek to overturn also grieves God, but we're all sinners and he forgives us all when we repent. The scripture teaches if we, if we repent, he is faithful and just to forgive us. May he also grant that we will rise up the body of Christ to support the sanctity of life with everything that is within us and until Roe versus Wade is reversed. I want to talk to you about another great sin, fiscal debauchery. Suppose I were to tell you that uh, I had bought Ellen a new coat and instead of paying for it, signed it up on the credit card of our son Will. Or suppose uh, I told you that Ellen and I together had bought a magnificent new automobile, say, a Bentley or a Rolls-Royce or a Maserati. Ellen will vouch for the fact that we have done no such thing. <laughs> but suppose we had, and then, instead of paying for it, signed a promissory note that promised that our daughter Anne and her husband and their five children would pay the bill. Well, you'd think that if we did that, it'd be pretty bad. But then suppose, in addition, we bought a magnificent house, a palace of a house, and signed a long-term mortgage, which we didn't intend to pay, but which by its terms obligated our children and their children to pay. <coughs> you would think that uh, we'd lost our mind. You would think we had created a great moral wrong. And yet that, may I say to students, is exactly to the shame of my generation what we have done. My generation has spent enormous sums of money on things that we deem to be proper and important and worthwhile and have promised that your generation will go ahead and pay the bill. Now, from the beginning of our country in 1789 until the start of the 20th century, federal spending didn't actually amount to very much. 
Even by 1901, total federal spending was only $525 million. Uh, since there were 76 million people living in the country on that date, that amounted to about $8 per person. As a result of World War I, federal spending ballooned to $6.3 billion in 1920. That's $60 per person. But quickly fell back to $3.1 billion in 1930, about $25 per person. By 1945, at the peak of World War II, when we were the arsenal of democracy, federal spending peaked at $92 billion, about $662 per person. But then as the war ended, federal spending declined. In fact, it dropped by half by 1950. And then in the 60s, the great spending binge began. I mean to tell you that members of Congress began to spend money like drunken sailors on shore leave in Tijuana. <laughs> I really shouldn't say that. <laughs> that. That comparison is actually insulting to drunken sailors <laughs> who, whatever else you may say about them, at least were spending their own money. Well, in any event, by 19... <laughs> if you didn't get that, I'll explain it later. By 1972, <laughs> Federal spending reached $1,136 per person. 1990, $5,032 per person. In the middle 1990s, when many of you were born, federal spending amounted to $1.5 trillion in this country, $5,785 per person living in the United States. This year, in the current budget year, it is estimated that federal spending will come to $3.8 trillion, a staggering $12,113 per person. That's about $50,000 That's about $50, per family. Now let me point something out. During that long period, uh, way over a century, over a century and a half, during which federal government spending was basically very small, and federal involvement in our day-to-day -day life was very small, America did very well. Population increased from 4 million to 152 million. Economic prosperity, as measured by the gross domestic product, increased by 4,000 percent, or by 1,300 percent, adjusted for inflation. Meantime, the average work week dropped from 80 hours a week to less than half that number. Life expectancy doubled. The slaves were freed. Women were granted the right to vote. America won two world wars and twice saved the European continent from starvation. And in this period of time, in this creative period of time, we invented the steamboat, the cotton gin, telephone, telegraph, radio, television, the automobile assembly line, vulcanized rubber, the mechanical reaper, polio vaccine, airplanes, and thousands of other necessities like sticky notes and frisbees. We became the most powerful economy in the world, the most admired and imitated nation, inspiring political and economic freedom and reform around the world. And all of this happened while the government was small and left the private sector pretty much alone. With little government, human ingenuity and entrepreneurship produced progress, prosperity, and freedom. This is not primarily a money issue. It's not primarily about federal finance. It's about human progress and freedom. Well, the spending spree resulted in money for a lot of programs, some of which were worthwhile. Many of them, frankly, were horrendous waste. Two weeks ago, the Denver Post reported that $750 billion a year, most of it paid for by the federal government, is being wasted in health care. 